All right, perfect. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. So if you're watching this video and after you're done with this video, you want to hit me up because you got some more questions, give me a call. My number is 239-784-1118. I'm going to get right into it. We're going to be talking about today the Index Universal Life and what kind of presentation it is that I give. What kind of presentation it is that I give when it comes to, um, when, there we go, I got a little competition going on. What kind of presentation is it that I give when it comes to the Index Universal Life, right? Um, a couple things, regardless of what you're selling, whether you're selling an IUL, whether you're selling a term policy, whether you're selling a final expense policy or a GUL, always, always put into consideration the client's needs, what's best for them. I'm gonna say this right away and IUL is not always the answer for every single client. I had a meeting today where I met with an individual who's got a client who's 62 years of age, who's looking to put money in and everything he kept hearing about was the IUL, the IUL, the IUL. And the first thing that I said, I said, listen, a 62 year old, I don't recommend it as an asset, right? She's trying to accumulate money. I said, I don't recommend it. I said, now, if she really wants to put in some serious dollars because she's trying to preserve and, and, and give herself some insurability long-term, it could be an option. But even then, I'd probably lean her more towards a GUL. Why do I say this? It's not the answer for everything. But I will tell you this, for the 20-year-old, the 30-year-old, the 40-year-old, the 50-year-old that's putting in some decent change, some decent amount of money, it's a phenomenal vehicle. It really genuinely is a phenomenal vehicle because it covers a lot of things. It covers insurability, giving someone insurance for a long period of time, number one. It covers cash accumulation, the ability to earn money based on market performances without market risk, right? To be able to say that you're earning, you know, uh, um, you know, a, a net five, uh, a six, a seven percent interest rate on a tax-free basis is number three, right? So, so you've got insurance that'll last you for the rest of your life. You've got, you've got interest rates that you're going to earn above inflation. Without market risk, that's always that's always very attractive. And then number three, the ability to know that that money that you're earning is going to be tax free, so that later on you could use it as an asset towards retirement. I mean, it, it's it, it's it's taking care of a lot of needs in one product. And I'm going to throw in number four um, is is the living benefits that some of these uh, products bring to the table. Not every product but some of these products bring to the table living benefits. And what I mean by living benefits is terminal illness. If you're about to pass away, you got less than 12 months left to live, access to money. Um, chronic illnesses, chronic illnesses such as uh, the need for a nurse to take care of you. If you're not able to perform what's called acts of daily living, ADLs. If you need to know what ADLs are, acts of daily living, go on Google, search it up, and you'll see what those are. And then the other one is critical illnesses. And injuries, things like cancer, strokes, heart attacks, organ transplants, you know, 40% or more burns to the body, brain traumas, paralyzation, you know, things like that, giving you access to the money, right? This is a phenomenal vehicle that is perfect. It is absolutely perfect if you're working the lead generation game with mortgage protection leads. It's absolutely, utterly perfect. Why? Because most people that get into mortgages are 20, 30, and 40 years of age. They're in the perfect age bracket for that product. If they have the budget. If they have the budget. So the right type of fact finding is always going to be important. Okay, doing a dime analysis. I talked about that this morning. If you need to know more about doing a dime analysis, check out the, check out the YouTube channel. You'll see under, I believe under life insurance playlist, you'll see that I did I, I recorded this morning's training on dime analysis. But that's important because you need a first... Before you recommend something, you need to first make sure that you get the right amount of insurance that the person needs. And then number two, you got to get the right budget. Those two things will help you determine which product do you want to recommend. Do you want to recommend a term policy because of their budget? Do you want to recommend an IUL product because of their budget? Like it just, it, there's a lot of different variables associated to it. But in the same token, everything that you're selling, you start off at a 50 foot bird's eye view. And what you're doing is you're asking a series of questions to isolate and to, 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 to do not isolation, to do what's called the process of elimination. So you start off 50 foot bird's eye view. 
right? I work in the area of insurance and investments. I specialize in income tax reduction strategies, business planning, insurance management. What do you want to talk about today, right? And then you dig deeper. Hey, do you believe in life insurance? Yes. Okay, good. You're a believer of insurance, right? Hey, are, are, you know, are you aware of the types of insurances that exist? No, let me explain them to you. Here's term insurance. Here's GUL. Here's IUL. Which of these three are you more interested in? Oh, I'm interested in IUL. Once they give you that, you know, you want to make, you, you then can go ahead and, and, ex, and, and do a diamond, you know, do a diamond analysis to find out how much insurance somebody needs. But then after that, you want to give them an overview, not an illustration, an overview of how an IUL works. If they express interest in that overview, then you dig deeper and you start showing them some actual illustration numbers based on the budgets that they're telling you they're interested in doing. And today, I'm going to give you that overview. I'm going to give you that presentation, right? I don't give this presentation, guys, until I've done the hustle presentation and explained the three types of insurances. Until I've, ex until, until I've, I, I've discussed with them lightly if they have the budget to afford such a product, because this is not a product to be putting 100 bucks a month away in unless you're doing it on a child. It's, it's just not. So I've had all of those Q and A's before I give them this, this, uh, this, what I like to call a napkin presentation. And this presentation is called the two buckets presentation, the two buckets. So go ahead and, you know, grab a notepad, write that bad boy down. Same rules apply guys. Whenever I do a face-to-face -face type presentation with a client, I'm doing it with a yellow note, a yellow legal pad. I'm doing it with a black Sharpie. Yellow is good for people who are are visually impaired. Black gives nice, clean, crisp, thick lines. It's better than a pen. And I and that, and that sheet of paper that I'm drawing and turns into my business card, that's what I tear off. That's what I leave behind, okay? But let me get right into it here. Um, let's talk about how an IUL works. The first thing I want to address is this, right? What are the three ways that money grows, right? Because an IUL is an asset, not an expense. That's the biggest, that's how I always start. An IUL, otherwise known as a LIRP, L-I-R-P stands for Life Insurance Retirement Planning, L-I-R-P, right? Um, that type of product is an asset, not an expense. It's an asset because if you structure it the right way, you're going to make more money than what you put in. Anything that makes you more money than what you put in is an asset. Would you agree? Right? It's not like, like mortgage, like, um, like homeowner's insurance is an expense. You pay into it and you pay into it and you pay into it, crossing your fingers, your house never lights up on fire. But if it does light up on fire, you've got some money, you've got insurance that's going to be able to replace the cost, but it's never going to be an asset. It's always an expense. Well, an IUL or AKA alert is always, always, always going to be an asset if structured properly. It'll, it'll be an asset if structured properly properly. Okay. So let me first explain the three ways that money grows. The first way, this is where 80% of America loves to put their money. Okay. This is what I like to call the fixed strategy right now. Now, let me, let me, if, if you, if you want to chime in, feel free to chime into the questions that I'm going to give, because one thing I want you to know about my presentations is that it's, it's an engagement, right? I'm not trying to just present. I'm trying to get them to engage with me. I'm trying to get them to be back and forth with me because I know that if they're responding, they're paying attention, right? So if you have to think of a, of a, of a, of a, of a fixed investment, something that's predictable, something, something that you know what the interest rate is, most people think about what place to put their money. Anybody? bank the bank that's right they think about putting their money in the bank and when you think of the word the bank you know that your money is going to be what protected protected or safe right so this is the fixed strategy because money here is safe and the bank also gives you access to the money very easily so the money is also going to be liquid right that's the benefit What's the negative to putting money in the bank? Are you, are you making a strong rate of return? Not really. You're really not. You're, you're, you're making less than 1%. So if inflation 
here, if inflation today sits at just under 4%, are you safely growing your money or are you still safely losing the value of your money? You're still safely losing the value of your money because you can't keep up with the cost of living. This is where 80% of America puts their money. The second place you can put your money is in the stock market. And what does the stock market do? Right, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. It's a very unpredictable environment. It's a very volatile environment. Do people go here for safety? Not at all. They go here, right here, the potential reward. Otherwise known as the rate of return. They're banking and they're saying, man, I hope I don't retire here. I hope I retire up here. 15% of America still puts their money here. Right? This is steady eddy. This is aggressive out. Steady eddy and aggressive out. Right? Now, 80 plus 15 is 95. Well, where's the other 5% of America put their money? The other 5% of America, which happens to be the top 5% of America. I'm talking about the cream of the crop, the wealthiest of the wealthiest people. They put their money into what's called index funds. Now you might, I don't know if you know what an index fund is, but you might know what this name is, the S&P 500 index, the Dow. Do any of those names kind of ring a bell, right? If you watch C-SPAN, you'll see this little, you know, this, this, this bar at the bottom of the TV screen, just kind of playing numbers and, and just kind of rolling numbers. In there, you're going to see the S&P 500 index, right? Now, what exactly is an index? An index is a collective measurement of a group of, of, group of investments, so for example, the S&P 500 measures the top 500 companies, right? We don't know who those 500 are. It's pretty predictable who they're going to be, right? It's the, it's the Ford, the General Motors, the Procter & Gamble, the Amazons, the, the Tesla, the Facebooks, right? They're the top 500 companies. But that index is a collective measurement of all 500. It's the average. And sometimes that average is up, sometimes that average is down. Right now, when you invest into an index, this is what you're saying to yourself. You're saying, hey, when, oh, here we go. when the market goes up, right? I want to go up with the market, right? Up to a limit. I have a limit, I have a ceiling, right? Now, why on earth would anybody take a ceiling, right? You think about that, you're like, man, if the market's doing good, you want to keep making money with the market, right? But they're going to give you a ceiling. Why are you, why are you willing to take on a ceiling? The reason you're taking on a ceiling is because if the market goes down, if the markets go down, you're going to flatline to a floor. The floor is 0%. That means that the worst thing that could ever happen, the worst thing that could ever happen to your money is that you don't make any money on that given year. If the markets do negative, you don't make anything, but you don't lose anything. That means you stay where you last left off. That way, when the market decides to recover, because the markets always recover, right? What goes up must come down, what comes down comes back up. When the market starts to come back up, you're gonna come back up not from the bottom, though. You're going to come back up from where you last left off. So your money goes up kind of like a staircase. You'll never see it go down into the negatives. Right? That seems pretty attractive. Well, wait a minute. My floor is zero. What's my ceiling? The ceiling, depending on the company, could be anywhere from 9 to 12%. That's pretty attractive to know that you could make up to nine to 12%, but you're also never gonna lose anything. You're, you know if the markets go down, you're gonna, you're gonna be at a, at a you're, you're, you're not gonna lose it, you'll be at a 0% floor. That's not even the most attractive thing about this vehicle. It's not. The most attractive thing about this vehicle is that this, when it's managed by an investment grade insurance company, grows your money. Let's do it in green, because I like that my color grows your money tax free tax free i'll repeat it tax free tax free 
you know when you get your paycheck on the first one or the 15th, right? And you're looking at that stub and you look at that net number and you compare it to that gross number, you know what the difference is between gross and net? Taxes. You know, I think about this. How differently would your life be on a month-to-month -month basis if you got to keep all your tax money and you didn't have to pay that? I mean, I know I've seen some statements where it's like, you know, 300 bucks every two weeks. That's like a car payment, right? You look at it, you know, times two, that's 600 bucks a month. That's, that's half of a rent and half of a mortgage. This is showing you a place where you're going to grow your money completely and utterly tax free. So how does this investment actually work? Let me explain it to you for a minute, right? So what I'll do here, guys, is I'll tear out the page. I'll put it on the table. I'll take out another page, right? And I, and I begin and I continue with my two buckets presentation. So let me show you. What if I showed you a vehicle? I showed you this bucket where you could put in however much money you wanted in this bucket. However much money you wanted in this bucket. Kind of fun trivia question. Anybody know why this dollar sign is the way that it is? Does anybody know the reason why? Nobody knows the history behind it? Okay. It's been, it's been abbreviated, but this is actually a U.S. United States. That's where the dollar sign came from. Pretty cool, right? Anyways, back at it. Sorry. My ADD kicked in. So what if I showed you a bucket where you can put in however much money you want, knowing that you have the safety of a bank where if the market goes down, you're going to have a 0% floor guarantee. You're going to get the ability to earn money like the stock market, right? That, that second, that's the second place I showed you, right? The, the rate of return at a 9 to 12%. And because this is, an, this is managed... This is managed by an investment grade insurance company. The proceeds are now tax free. What if I told you that this bucket does this? The one question you're thinking is what? What's the, somebody answer for me. What's the what? I see Laura there. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Laura. What's the what? What's the catch? That's right, what's the catch? That sounds too good to be true. Here's the catch. There's a second bucket right here. You see this spigot? This spigot is going to pour out some of your money. Some of your money that goes in here is going to go into this bucket over here. This right here is insurance premiums. What kind of insurance are we talking about here? How about life insurance? And we're going to use a hypothetical $500,000 worth of it. So what does this mean? That means some of the money that you're putting in here that's earning this interest rate is going to fall into this bucket to pay for the insurance premiums. How do I get access to this money? Well, insurance, if you die, life insurance, you're going to get a death benefit. Your family would get this half a million plus the cash that's been accumulated in this second bucket here. You're also going to get what's called living benefits. Living benefits means you didn't pass away, but you developed a sickness or you developed enough of an illness that you need a nurse to take care of you. And then therefore you haven't passed away, but you're in a pretty chronic or critical state. You need access to this half a million dollars, not only to maybe pay for the medical bills, but you might need it to pay for your living expenses, like your electric, your rent, right? Food in the table, water, your kid's tuition. You might need to do that because you're not working at the moment. Well, you get living benefits, which means you get access to this money without tapping into this, because this money was always put in here for what? retirement. It wasn't put away for those types of emergencies. That's what this is for. Right? That's how this product, this program essentially works. This program gives you what I like to call perks. P-E-R-C-S. Well, what are the perks? The P stands for protection. You have your insurance money that'll protect you and your family. The E stands for access to the money in the event of an emergency. You know why that's important? Because this money here, if you do need to tap into it, you can tap into it for an emergency or for whatever reason you want. And you don't have to worry about this one rule called the 59 and a half rule. 
the 59 and a half rule is a rule that's implemented onto your 401ks and your IRAs that says if you tap into your money before 59 and a half years of age, you're going to pay a 10% early withdrawal penalty. This doesn't have that. So you can tap into this money before retirement and not pay a penalty for doing it. The R stands for what most people love to do is they like to retire from, use the money for retirement. Parents love to use this money for college savings. And the traditional saver of any sort, any kind of a saver, likes to use this money just for average everyday savings. Because let's face it, if you put 200 bucks away in a savings account, right? And then something happens to you, how much money do you leave behind to your family? 200. If you put another 200 next month, you got 400. You put another 200 in next month, you got 600. So they got 600 bucks in there. If you pass away on the third month, you leave your family with 600. You put in 200 bucks a month here, and then another 200 you have four, and then another 200 you have 600. After three months, and then you pass away. You leave your family with, the, you leave your family with what? $500,000 worth of insurance. If that makes any sense. Whoever is mute, whoever's unmuted, if you could just mute yourself real quick, please. But essentially, that's what this does. Now, here are the two downsides to this vehicle. Two, because there's no such thing as a perfect plan. My job is to show you the pros and the cons and how this could fit inside of your portfolio. There's no such thing as a perfect plan. The moment they create and invent the perfect plan, I am out of work because everybody will know just to go there. I've made a lot of money because I put my money there as well, right? There's no perfect plan. So what are the two, what are the two downsides to this? Number one, this is not short term. In no way, shape, or form is this a short-term vehicle. This is not a, I'm going to go in for one year, two years, and then stop. No. This is a, I'm going to go in for a consistent amount of time. My recommendation is a minimum of 10 years. 10-year minimum. Anything longer than that, and it's, 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 it's much more beneficial to do it, but you need to go in for at least a 10-year period to be able to get back at least what you put in. It's not a short-term vehicle. Pay yourself first. And the last piece is, the last piece is you have to qualify with your health. Why? Because the insurance company is going to put themselves on the hook from the very beginning with the, with the insurance money, whether it's 100000 or 500000 or a million. You make only one payment and then you pass away. They got to pay out that money to your family. So you have to have the health to qualify. So if your health is bad, there's a chance you might not qualify into this program. Do you know the wealth of America? Do you know how soon they begin these plans for their family members? Two weeks after they're born. Because that's when they're the healthiest. And because it's very easy to invest long-term for a two-week-old. Do you know when, when middle America traditionally starts these? In their 20s and 30s. Which is still much more beneficial than not doing anything at all. So Mr. Klein, based on this presentation... On a scale of one to 10, one, totally not interested. This is the biggest waste of my time. Or 10, I'm very interested. I want to know more. Where do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself? And when they give me their answer, 90% of the times it's, I'm a nine, I'm a 10. Great. No problem. What kind of dollars can you see yourself putting in here long-term? Where whether it's a good month or a bad month, you can still consistently put your dollars in there. Right? And I'll tell you this for sure. If they give me anything $300 a month or higher, I'm doing a budget. I'm going to do a budget to make sure that they have that kind of money left over every month. Because there's no sense in going through all the work of underwriting, getting them approved for this product. And then two months in, they can't afford it. And they stop making payments. And you have to deal with the chargeback. There's no point. If I'm getting 300 bucks a month, they got to have at least $600 discretionary after they pay all their bills. And they got to be able to show me that they have some type of a savings pattern already. Someone doesn't have 600 bucks a month every single month, but zero dollars in savings. I'm sorry. It, and like, what have you been doing the last, you know, year, two years of your life that you haven't been able to put something away? That's, that's my philosophy. And you're, and you're going to have your own. This is mine because of my experiences that I've had. Because of my experiences that I've had in when, I, when I gather a big dollar amount per month. 
And if you can collect the payment for the whole year, even better. Because if you collect the payment for the whole year, number one, you get advanced the entire commission for the year. Number two, the person compounds their money faster because the money comes in all at once. And number three, you ain't gotta worry about chargebacks. So I see a couple of people have their hands raised. What questions do you have that I can help answer? Because I just gave you my two buckets presentation. And the next step from here would be to gather a monthly commitment and then run some actual illustrations and come back in a follow-up meeting. I don't like to close on first meeting when it comes to this. I prefer a second meeting. Give me some time to run some illustrations, look at some comparisons between some companies, right? I'm a broker. I don't want to make the person see, feel like I just got the illustration in my back pocket. Like, no, I represent a bunch of companies. Let me shop out the market for you. Let me get back to you. Here's a tip for you. If they keep their second meeting, that person has a high likelihood of buying versus trying to pressure them to buy in the first meeting and then they cancel later on. So I'm when it comes to these types of products, I'm a second meeting type of guy. What questions do you guys have that I can help answer? Tony? Yes, ma'am. It's for late. So under the emergency, you did cover that it's a long-term commitment, but what if they tell you how soon can I access my money? Or if I have an emergency in the next year or two, can I access my money? Yeah, good question. Good question. So using my rule of thumb is this, if you need access to money in the event of an emergency, you'll start seeing, you'll start seeing some of your dollars coming in between years four and five. That's when you're going to typically start. Now I can get you access to money within the first year, second years, but now you, but that all depends on the dollar amount that you're going to put in because I've got to design it that way for you. However, I want you to understand something, Mr. Client, this is for emergencies. This is not because you want to take a trip, a cruise to the Bahamas, and you're, you're tight on your short-term savings. It doesn't work that way. Mr. Klein, I want you to know something. If you treat this as short-term, you're going to get back less than what you put in. Are you looking at me right now when I tell you this? If you treat this as a short-term vehicle, I guarantee you, you're going to get back less than what you put in. My job is to make you feel uncomfortable today so that you can feel comfortable later. There's nobody that's willing to take on that role right now in your life. Would you agree? Because your tax accountant wants to make you feel comfortable today by giving you tax deductions today and let you deal with it later. I'm talking about growing your money tax-free later, but I got to make you feel uncomfortable today. Any other questions? Thank you, Tony. You're welcome. And if you guys want, hit me up with whatever objection you think someone would give you, and I'll give you my verbiage towards it. So Tony, this is Tanisha. Yes, um, so you're saying that someone who would be an ideal candidate for an IUL needs to be able to put in at least around $300 a month, have uh, $600 or more discretionary income a month and have a nice lump sum of savings to increase the, or decrease the likelihood that they would um, need to tap into that, that um, policy, right? No, no. Yes and no. Yes and no. So when it comes to the monthly dollar amount, I've learned based on age, what should be the minimum. If I'm dealing with children, anything from 50 to hundred bucks a month is a very, is a, is a, is a good amount. When I'm dealing with 20 year olds between 20 and 30 years of age, you gotta be, you gotta look at, you know, 125 to 200 as like your bare minimums. When I start dealing with 30 year olds, I'm talking 200 plus a month. When I'm dealing with 40 year olds, listen, you got to give me a 250 to $300 a month kind of a number for it to even be attractive. Now, that's not to say that if, I, if a 40 year old comes to me and says to me, listen, I'm on a really tight budget, but I really want to do this. I can afford 125, 150 a month that it won't work. What will happen though, unfortunately, is that their insurance policy will be so stinking small because the cost of insurance for that person, since they're older, will that, that policy will become very cash rich, but it just won't have the type of insurance benefits that would, would make for an ideal type of a policy. But the, 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 this is why I say yes, no, right? I, the no, I just kind of showed you what numbers. If I'm dealing, no lie, 50 plus market, they got to be putting in 400 bucks a month plus. And, and even then, like, I'm looking more for the $1,000 a month type of person. 
because the 40 year old only has 20 years left before they hit retirement. So they've got to really take advantage of those 20 years to compound their money for it to even be attractive. Now that that's the no. Now the yes answer to your question is when someone says to me, regardless of their age, I don't care if they're 20 years of age or 60 years of age. If they tell me that they want to do 300 plus a month, I want to know that after they pay their bills every month, they've at least got 600 bucks a month left over. And I want to know that they can show in their balance sheet that they've already, you know, they're already somewhat of a saver, right? It's very hard for me especially like a 20 year old, I'm not even gonna lie, like in their twenties, it's very hard for me to get a $300 a month commitment from someone. And then you do a budget on a 20 year old and they got 50 bucks left over after they bought all their McDonald's and Chick-fil-A. And they've got, they've got, they've got negative five cents in their savings account. Like, wait a minute, you don't have a hat. You don't have a good pattern of being a good saver. Now all of a sudden I'm gonna collect 300 bucks a month from you because here's the reason why at a hundred percent contract level, Right, a field agent getting hundred percent contract, thirty six hundred bucks in, in uh, three hundred bucks a month is thirty six hundred of annual premium for a twenty year old. That's a three thousand six hundred dollar commission. So now I gotta worry every month if you make your payment for the first twelve months. Otherwise, I get a charge back. Like I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to. I don't want to make the money and then have to pay the money back. Like I don't want to deal with that. So when someone says to me three hundred bucks a month or more. My conversation is, okay, listen, let's talk about your assets. If they tell me, well, you know, I got 40,000 sitting in my 401k. I got, you know, five grand put away in savings. I'm making $75,000 a year. That, okay, you're pretty responsible. You can do 300 bucks a month, no problem. But if you say to me, well, you know, you know, I, I don't got anything. I just got a new job. I got fired last week because I slept in and I got 50 cents in my savings. <laughs> and I owe three months of child support. Like, wait a minute, hold up. <laughs> You are not gonna mess up my business. Does that make sense? That, that's kind of how I that, that's kind of how I do it. What are the questions you guys have or objections that you feel you would get that I could give you the verbiage to? Okay. Okay, so what about the person who you're saying all this to? They've got the um you know, they've got the money to do it, but you're like, you, you honestly don't think that it's the, the best for them, but they're like, they're like on the lower end of the scale. You know what I'm saying? So they barely have enough money to put in, but they meet your requirements. Yeah. Um, you know, and, but they're adamant, you know, you know, you're like, well, this might be better for you to get such and such so you can have more coverage you know, yeah. but they're adamant about, no, I want to go ahead and I just want to put my money into this. What yeah. do you, you know, what do you say to be, fidu you know, do your fiduciary responsibility? Cause you, mm -hmm. you know, they sit up with like four kids and you're like, dude, you 50 K is not enough of life insurance for you, but that's all you can afford on the IUL. What are yeah. you going to do? Are you going to try to convince them to up their coverage by like, you know, your 50 bucks, you know, to add that term on there or what yeah. do you, yeah, so a couple things. Number one, I'm gonna try and see if I can sell a sell an ant, sell a term policy on the side to increase the person's insurability. Because yes, just like you said, they got three, four kids, 50 grand is not enough. I'm gonna try to do that. That's option one. Number two, if I genuinely feel like it's a bad recommendation, um, I can get I I I will ask my client to sign a, a letter stating that I didn't recommend this, even though they want it. I want that. Because if, it, if, if, if in the future they want to argue and be like, well, I didn't know I could have purchased the term insurance. He was just trying to push an IUL down my throat. I got that letter to show, no, no boo-boo. Like, I told you, you shouldn't have gotten this. Here's the letter that I, I, as your agent, recommended you not get it, but you were adamant about it. So I'd rather you have something than not have anything, even though that wasn't my recommendation. I'm, I, I will get that letter from the client. And then lastly... And I say this to everybody, regardless of the product, if you ever feel like there's something shady happening, this is one of the many benefits of being an entrepreneur. You can pick who, you, who your business partners are. You can also pick who your clients are. You can refuse business. Right now, I refuse business if I feel like there's something shady going on from like, uh, I'm trying to hide money. You know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get one on someone. Um, you know, they're trying to hide something medically that they know is happening to them. That kind of stuff. I'll refuse business completely. I, I will. Um, it'll bite you in the butt. 
in the world of insurance, you're you're guilty until proven innocent, not the other way around. Right. So you got to have your your case notes. And I'm not trying to scare you guys into any of this. You know, not, that's not the point. But I'm also being very rare, very realistic. You know, clients will remember everything you told them until it isn't working in their favor. And then when it's not working in their favor because of maybe third party circumstances, because they got a divorce, because they lost their job, because of whatever reason, now all of a sudden they forgot what the conversation was, <laughs> was like. So, so, so I, I'm very good with case notes when it comes to that kind of stuff. So how do you do, what's that conversation or what's that verbiage when you are refusing that business, you find out they are doing something that you're not trying to get involved in? Um, I mean, honestly, I, I always think, I always think kind of, I'm very direct. People will tell you if they know me, like I'm just very direct. I'm like, listen, I, I'll be honest with you. I wish you the very best, but I, I don't feel comfortable transacting this business. I, you know, and, and I don't, and, and my license is not something that I'm willing to risk because it is my life. And I, and I, honestly, I'll just, I'll just end it like that. Like, and if they don't like it, I apologize. Now, granted, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, that doesn't happen that often. And you know why it doesn't happen that often? I, I fact find, here's, you know, if you read anything, I have, like when you do your anti-money laundering courses and all that other stuff, when you see a client that is so quick to, to, to sign up, there's something there. Like they're waiting. You, you, I haven't even told you half the presentation. You ready to sign up and give me your 50 grand? Like there's something shady already happening there. So I'm very good about asking questions in the beginning so much that somebody who wants to do something shady will get annoyed with the QA. And and all they're, and just so you know, what they're looking for is they're looking for a rookie agent who doesn't have experience and just wants to make a quick sale to transact. But, you know, my agents, agents will come to me all the time. Hey, Tony, I got this client. You know, what would you recommend? My answer always to every one of my agents is, I don't know. We got to meet with them. I got to ask them. I got to see what their objectives are. I got to see what their time horizons are. I got to see what their budgets are. I'm not going to give you a recommendation when I don't know the situation. You know what I mean? Like, if, 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 if think about it. If, if I'm a doctor and you come walking in to my clinic and I hand you a pill and I say, here, take this for three days and come back, what are you going to say? Wait a minute, why do you, how do you know this is going to work for me? If you want a doctor that's going to ask questions and diagnose you, it's the same thing. Same concept. Now, here's the piece of mind I will give you, Tanisha. That doesn't happen often. It doesn't happen often. Honestly, it doesn't happen often. So, but just, you know, be alert for it. What, 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 what questions? Anybody have any other questions, objections that you feel you would get in this world? So, Tony, this is Puebla again. I had um, a meeting with a couple uh, this weekend uh -huh. uh, where he he has a term policy that it's, it's going to expire in five years. And he, he, after I explained and I did my presentation, he wants a permanent policy, but it's not within his budget. And so I obviously recommended not to cancel his curtain policy because he has to have some type of insurance. He has a mortgage, mm -hmm. um, he has a family, he's the breadwinner, but I mean, it's one of those scenarios where I, I have to do the right thing for the client and mm -hmm. it's not within his budget. So I didn't push, I didn't try to convince. I was very honest as far as like, I understand you want a permanent policy, but it's not within your budget, so I'm not able to help you with it. I mean, how, yeah. how else would I have said it? How how would you have said it? Yeah, so here, here's how I, I would say it. I go, um, let me ask you a question, Mr. Clay. Um, do you want me here for the long term towards your retirement goals or the short term? Let them answer. They're always, I want you here for the long term. Okay. So if you want me here for the long term, can I be honest with you for a moment? Yes. Okay. If I was talking to you and you were my blood, I would tell you to pick up another term policy and stretch out that five years for another 10 to 15 years and make it a point in these next 10 to 15 years to reduce your expenses and increase your income. And the moment you have additional dollars, convert your term insurance into that permanent plan that you want. But I'd rather you have something that's going to take you out longer than five years that fits within your budget than to sign up for something that three months from now you're not going to be able to pay. And then you lose all coverage. I said, so if you want me here for the long haul, that's what I'm willing to provide to you. Now, if you just want me, you know, as a fly-by-night quickie, 
all right, then great. Like, you know, you're not doing yourself justice. And, and guys, I, I will tell you this. This hasn't happened to me often, but, you know, it, it, it's happened to me maybe a handful of times in 15 years. When a client is adamant about, no, 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 I want that policy no matter what, you know what I'll do? I'll submit the ad, I'll get a cover letter, and I'll tell the insurance company, insurance company, do not advance me commission, pay me as earned. Pay me as earned. There's no point in you giving me a big advance if, I'm, if I risk having to pay it back. Pay me as earned. If he makes a payment, pay me. If he makes a payment, pay me. If he doesn't make a payment, don't pay me, but at least I don't, I don't compromise my, my income. I'll, I'll do that. Because here's the reality. You ever meet those people that you know for sure they broke with a joke, but they always want name brand Gucci. You know what I mean? They always want the best. They won't settle for less because they're, you know, they're, they're too good for it. You do a good hustle presentation, I guarantee you they're never going to look at Terminal GUL. That person only wants IUL, and yet the bill collectors are knocking on their door. That's all they want because they always want the best of the best. They are the one-uppers of the world. That, that sometimes can happen. So again, cover letter, number one, and then number two, um, number two, be willing to take your, your commissions on an as earned basis versus an advanced basis. And no lie, guys, that's happened. Every scenario here that you guys have thrown at me, the, those worst case scenario type situations, I mean, maybe two out of every thousand cases that I've ever worked. So don't, don't feel like you got to prep yourself for that world on a consistent. It'll happen to you, you know, five years from now, randomly on a day, it's unexpected. You know what I mean? Most people won't respond that way. Any other questions? No, no, no. Okay. Guys, this is a presentation that I'm not going to, I'll tell you right now, I learned it. I learned it like eight years ago. And it has been my, my go-to. Some people like to sell on an illustration. I've learned to sell on that. Because once I do that, you know what most clients will tell me is I really like that. I really want to do something like that. I totally understand. I can do 300 bucks a month. And then I'll tell them this. I'll say, listen, my recommendation to you is XYZ company. I don't know what the numbers are going to look like until you apply. When you apply, and they approve is when we'll have the final numbers. And when they approve you and they give you these final numbers, you and I got to review it before we go forward with it. If this is something you'd like to do, it's going to take about four weeks to underwrite this. You let me know if it's something you want to do and we can apply, right? And, and, and see what the company says to see if you qualify. When people feel they have to qualify to something, they will do everything in their power to qualify. Psychologically, they want to qualify. So that's my verbiage with them. When I do it like that, guys, nine times out of 10, I don't even need to show them an illustration in the beginning. I can, I can literally gather all the information that I need for an application. I can run the illustrations before I submit the application. I can send, I can send the client the application and the illustration. They'll sign it and send it in because they already know even the illustration that I sent them is subject for changing because the company still has to review their application and approve them. This isn't one of those, I wanna do it, I'm entitled. If when, when your client feels that they gotta qualify, you now have the upper hand. And when you now have the upper hand, they don't treat you like you're an order taker. They treat you like you're their ally, you're, you're their attorney, you're their accountant type of mentality. Like I hope this person gets me approved for what I'm looking for. That's the way that I typically have conversations with them. If I'm having a husband and a wife apply, this is my language with them before I submit the apps. I'll tell them, I say, listen, they're gonna look at both of you independently. What I don't wanna do is this. I don't wanna submit both applications. If one of you guys get declined, the other person cancels the policy because the, because the other person got declined. That doesn't make sense. So if we're going to apply, we're independently applying. But here's what I will tell you as a broker. If one of you gets declined and the other one gets approved, my advice, the one that gets approved should take this policy. But one that gets declined needs to give me a little bit more time to find a company that can relook at your application and get you approved. There's nothing wrong with a husband being in one company and a wife being in another company. But 
if you're telling me that I have to risk both of you either approved or both of you out, I would strongly reconsider. And I tell it to them just like that. I'm very big about preemptive, preemptive. When I apply and I tell the client, and this is for you guys, if you're ever gonna, if you're gonna get to the position where you get an assistant, I tell my client, I say, listen, these are the people that are in my team. These are my aces. They know more about the next steps than I do. When this is their name and I edify them, right? This is Nicole. She's one of the best case managers I've ever had that I work with. She's going to create a group chat between you, me, and her. And let me tell you something, Mr. Client. When she asks a question, the best thing you can do is respond quickly because she is working diligently with an underwriter to get you approved. The last thing you want to do is delay on answering. And I'm going to tell you something else. If you message me directly, it's going to take you, it's going to take a lot longer for you to get an answer because do you know who I'm going to call for the answer? Nicole. So rather than us playing telephone, I'm going to give you direct access to her. And when she gets this approved, you're going to know because she's going to let you know within 24 to 48 hours that that first payment is going to come out. Does that make sense, Mr. Client? Do you realize how much of an ace in the hole I've just given you with Nicole? She is the absolute best. I mean, I do that kind of level. Why? Because when I take the application, I'm a field agent. You know what I want to do? I want to get back out to the field and not worry about underwriting. Now the, now, now the ball, my assistant can take care of the rest of that piece and get that piece going. When you guys, when you guys are at that level, you're like, I want, to, I want to get an assistant. That's the kind of level of edification you want to do. You don't want your client to feel like, I can't, I can't get to the next step unless I hear directly from my agent. You get paid more money per hour being out in the field finding clientele than it is than it is underwriting and servicing the clientele. Now, if you're not in that position yet, then you got to have a very strict calendar. Morning time is the time that you give them updates. Evening time at nighttime is the time that you respond to emails. But in the middle of the day, you're on the field. You're on the field. Create great relationships with underwriters, phenomenal relationships with underwriters, your case managers, whoever, whoever those people are. Because those people are the difference between your application going on the top of their list or your application going at the bottom of the list just because you give them a hard time. I mean, those are the little tips that I would tell you in my years of experience that have dramatically helped me out. Today, 2021 May, and the reason I'm giving the date is because these, the, the, the information I'm about to give you is always subject to change. So as of right now, out four companies that we're primarily selling, right? You have Allianz. You have um, North American, you have Anico, you have NLG. If the customers, if the clients' biggest interest is living benefit, the best for living benefit out of all four of those is NLG. If the client's interest is cash accumulation, the best cash accumulation, Allianz. If the client's looking for the most holistic, the most well-rounded, American National. American National. If the client wants living benefits, but also wants one of the best North American, North American and Allianz are always competing. You look at them, they're A plus rated. They're always competing, competing for who's the best, who's the best, who's the best. Allianz has the best cash accumulation. Why? Because they don't have all of the living benefits. They have some, but they don't have all. So because they don't have all, that internal cost isn't there. Therefore, the cash accumulates a lot higher. But does that mean that you shouldn't sell Allianz? No, it means that you should sell Allianz and then attach a term policy with great living benefits. So I'm notorious for recommending an Allianz IUL with an Anico or an NLG term. NLG will do, do, will do up to $3 million non-medical. Allianz, uh, Anico will do, and, and North American as well, will do up to a million non-medical. Which one is going to be the strictest in underwriting? <sighs> ah, never mind. That's a toss up right now. I don't, even, I don't even want to answer that one. It's kind of a toss up, but just being honest with you, you know, um, North American has a two step application process. So you, so when you submit it electronically, they have to sign it and then the system will send them another email that they have to open up to ask them the medical questions. And based on how they answer those questions will determine whether they can do express underwriting without a medical needed or if they're going to need a medical. Anico is a one-time sign on the electronic. Okay. Allianz is notorious for ink signatures for everything. 
So amendments, delivery receipts, all that stuff, it's it's wet ink, not electronic, not electronic. Okay. Um, NLG is also a two-part process for signatures. So I'm giving you these little tips so that you, you learn and you know. If you're going to sell an IUL and it's going to be an express underwriting IUL, express meaning a guarantee that they're not going to request a medical, Mutual of Omaha has a pretty strong express IUL that'll go up to, I believe, 400000 express underwriting. And the IUL with, with Mutual of Omaha also has a return of premium writer that no other IUL has. So I'm throwing you all of these tips and these tips so that you know, you guys as brokers, you guys have tools galore. And I'm giving you the date because guess what? Those, that, that data that I'm giving you now is always subject to change. There could be another company we bring into the mix later on that, you know, that's doing better or where, you know, that, that can always change. That can always change. But right now, hands down, we have the best in the market to bring to the table to the clientele. I'm eager to see you guys go out there and present. I'm eager to see you guys go out there and attempt this presentation right here. It's not a hard one. It's not a hard one. I just, I take my time. When you do the presentation, the, the notorious things that people are, 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 are used to doing, and it's normal when you first present, you either speak really fast, you speak really, really quickly, hold off on speaking so quickly. The goal is to get them to understand. Presenters present. You're not trying to be a presenter. You're trying to be a storyteller. A storyteller will sell. you got to tell the story along the way. Enunciate. Speak clearly. Have conviction. Don't use, don't use weak words like kind of, maybe, you know, I think a little. No. But you have very strong. I have no problem telling the client, Mr. Client, listen, this is not short term. But if you want something that will earn a strong interest rate, above inflation on a tax-free basis and you're willing to think long-term, you're willing to do what the wealth of America do, this is absolutely 100% beyond the doubt one of the best vehicles I would recommend for you to do. But you got to do your part. You do your part and we'll do ours. I have no problem telling them that. Have conviction. And I say this to everybody as I close off. Find the business. If all you do is this presentation, you might say to me, Tony, we didn't do any training on how to run illustrations. I'm so scared. If you can get to a field meeting and do this presentation and get a monthly commitment, guys, I promise you can run right back to the office and someone will help you with illustrations. Someone will gladly help you running illustrations. Someone will even set up a time and role play with you on how to present the illustration because there is a way to present it. It's, it's a live, die, quit, or become disabled presentation. That's what I call it. The live, die, quit, or become disabled presentation. There is a way to present it. There is a way. But don't be like, oh, I'm not going to talk about this until I know how to do the presentation. You're shooting yourself in the foot, guys. Finding the business is, is three quarters of the battle. The other 25% is closing. Simple as that. Go out there and go kill it. Okay? Go out there and be have the conviction of knowing you have great companies to represent. Keep it simple. You saw that presentation back there? It was simple. In my opinion, it was at least simple. It's not hard. Three ways money grows, two buckets, perks. Protection, emergency, retirement, college planning, savings. <gasps> Done. What do you want to do monthly? Anybody have any questions before I close off today? No? Okay. Here's what I'll, all I want from you is this. I want, let me actually I see, let me see some stuff in the group chat. Okay, gotcha. I just want I just want your I just want your your top two takeaways on the group chat. Go on the group chat. There's people who, who missed out. Post post your top two biggest takeaways. I like to see those as well too because if for whatever reason the takeaway that you have it's a little bit incorrect and I know I gotta adjust the way that I explain things but I also gotta reach out to you and you know what I mean to help you uh, help you understand the right way. But I, I'd love to hear your top two takeaways. Uh, remind me what grip free stands for grip oh yeah yeah grip free so grip free is another acronym that i use right grip g guarantees r rate of return i uh income for life p is um uh protection and then the free is tax free so so and i can never is correct there's two acronyms that i use there's perks 
right? And then there's another acronym that I use called GRIP free. G guarantees, right? What's the guarantee? 0% floor guarantee, right? R rate of return, right? Strong rates of return. I income for life because when, when you draw money out of this vehicle, you can either take it out in lump sum or you can take it out as a lifetime stream of income. I and P protection, which is the insurance. And then the free is tax free, grip free. Good, good, cool stuff. I will tell you, I use the grip free more for um, annuities, indexed annuities, just grip. I don't do the free because unless it's a Roth IRA, it won't be tax free. But I use grip a lot when, when it comes to presenting indexed annuities. Have a good one, guys. Be blessed. I look forward to hearing your top two takeaways. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye.